Tonight we're in Jeremiah 17. If you turn in your Bibles to that chapter, and a reminder that tomorrow morning we need lights on in here. That would be very helpful to read Bibles. If we could just get house lights on. One, two, three. Yay! They're coming up slowly but surely. Hopefully more than that. Is that, is that like all the light there is? Is that like normal? Is that like a normal? Okay, that still looks dim to me, but... Starting tomorrow, at 9 in the morning and 6.30 in the evening, the women resume their Bible study. Tomorrow in Ruth and Esther, is that right? Is that correct? Pathway to God's plan. And uh, so for you ladies, tomorrow morning, I even slip in every now and then to catch it, and it's excellent. So um, that's tomorrow morning. Tonight, I want to begin by reading something that um, last week we had different uh, testimonials. They were very encouraging. Here's one from Hawaii, and I want to share it with you. Aloha, Skip, and the people of Ocean Hills. I just wanted to share the blessing that you have been in my life. I live in Maui. Somebody's got to do it. Rough job. And I go to a church here, but I found your website through the local Christian radio station. I was listening to Skip services on the radio as I drove to work each day, except it only takes me 20 minutes to get there. So I was sitting at work, I am a teacher, in the car listening to the remainder instead of getting ready for the kids. Anyway, they mentioned the website, so I decided to check it out. I've been experiencing an intense craving for more of God's Word. Since that day, I've been listening to all of the archived services. I listen to at least three services a week, and I feel a very strong connection to your fellowship. Today, I'm listening to the service from December 5th, so I'm nearly caught up to where you are now. Merry Christmas, I guess. I've grown so much closer in my relationship with Jesus. Thank you so much. And then she signs it with love. So, see, this stuff goes out all over the place, not just the radio broadcast, but the live webcast from this church through that little room back there. So thank you guys and gals and all that you are accomplishing there. Now, we're in Chapter 17 tonight, but we have a guest in our midst tonight, and he hates it when I do this, and that's exactly why I do this. Chip Lusco is with us. Chip, come on up here and just say something, some greetings of some kind. He was on my staff in Albuquerque. He is still on staff there. I'm not, of course, but he is, and he's always fun to listen to. Well, I do bring you greetings from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and um, it is part of the United States. So I want to make that clear. A lot of, lot of confusion about Albuquerque, a lot of confused people, but it's, I'm just grateful to be out here. It, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird uh, convocation of, of um, memories and excitement, and um, having observed Skip over the years and been, been um, privilege to serve alongside him and um, to know the dynamic mission that, that God has for him and Lenya. It's, um, it was, it seems, a long, long time ago, only a year ago uh, this month that we uh, packed them up and, uh, and gave them our love and sent them out from, from New Mexico. I got to tell you, they're missed. And uh, we've had a, a void there. God ha has filled it to a degree, but it's a, it's a bittersweet uh, a thing that happened in seeing Skip move out here. And yet, uh, we know in our hearts that his uh, ultimate obedience is to the calling God has given him. And um, Skip is a restless spirit. And that, that's part of, his, uh, part of his charm and part of, part of the genius that God has put in him. And uh, it's just exciting to know what lies ahead. And we live in, uh, it's no, no surprise, difficult days. We have uh, uh, trials in Albuquerque right now that are really extraordinary. We would uh, really covet your prayers for some of the things that are going on in our town that um, we just encourage you to pray for. But I just want to say it, it's great to, to be here and, and see what God's doing. And, uh, and really, you know, what, what comes to my mind is not so much the, um, um, the line on line and the, the graphics and all. It's, it's the faithfulness to God's word. I guess if I had a quick thing to say, it'd be, what is the husk to the kernel? And how much time we, we spend talking and worrying about the, the, the husk that's going to blow away. And it, it's all about the word. Amen. Thank you, Chip. Um, was that from touching this? 
we have problems in Houston. Um, if we wouldn't mind just praying specifically uh, for that fellowship, just for a few moments, and let me just be a little more specific. The, uh, the wife of someone that was on our staff recently had been, has been killed, and uh, there's a huge stigma attached because it was a murder. And uh, it, it's, when that happens, it rocks the entire community, not only the, the fellowship there, but the town and the state. And uh, let's just uh, spend a moment as we begin tonight and pray for that situation. Heavenly Father, um, you know all these things. They certainly do not escape your view. And uh, we just come before you as your people um, and many more who are joining us via the Internet. And we just all collectively pray for this situation for this husband, for those friends, for the family that is gathering together and having a memorial and uh, will never be able to fill that void because of this incident. We're so thankful that in spite of it all, you are in the midst working your plan. And we are also so thankful that she's with you in glory because she had that relationship that comes only through Christ. And as we think about her death, we think about the inevitability of death to every single person on earth. It is appointed to every man once to die. And after this, the judgment. So we pray that anyone who would be even listening to this words, these words who are not prepared would be prepared by resting totally in your arms in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles then. You've probably already done that. I need to open my Bible to Jeremiah chapter 17. Sin stinks. Isn't that a profound statement? You can quote me on that. Sin really stinks. There was a man, a grandpa, who was sleeping at his uh, family's house one Sunday afternoon after church, and he was on the couch, and his grandson decided to play a trick on him. Went to the refrigerator, got out some Lindberger cheese, and rubbed it on Grandpa's mustache. Grandpa woke up, not knowing what had happened. And he said, this room stinks. And the kids were in the other room snickering, laughing, because they had done it. Grandpa got up, went into the next room, and said, man, this, this room stinks too. Went into the kitchen. Boy, this entire house stinks smells. Grandpa went outside, smelled the neighborhood, said, the whole world stinks. Well, truth was, Grandpa stinks at that point, and he had Limburger cheese on his mustache, and so in his view, the whole world stinks. We are usually very good at pointing out other people's sins. We're good at smelling certain things only because we're familiar with the smell. It sort of follows us wherever we go. So we have to be careful whenever we're pointing out other people's faults that that fault isn't in our own life. The people of Judah were pointing out problems, not in their own lives, not even in the life of the country, but in the life of a prophet named Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you stink, they would say. And they persecuted him time and time again. But the truth was, is their own sin was reeking before God. And God was patient, but God was about to judge. And we come to some more of that um, topic and those statements in Jeremiah chapter 17. In, in this chapter, we sort of get a tour of the heart. The heart is always the problem when it comes to sin. We like to pointed on something outward, but the problem is always something inward. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. With the point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altars. A few thousand years ago, when pagan altars were dotting the landscape of Israel, Moab, the area on both sides of the Dead Sea, from Egypt to Mesopotamia, the altars had protrusions on them, little horns that came off the altars. And it wasn't untypical 
for idol worshipers to engrave the names of their gods on the horns of the altars. And it was something that was visible. So the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. It's engraved. It's something that can't be removed quite readily. It's permanent. It's etched. It's indelible is the idea. With the point of a diamond, it is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of your altars. There's a principle there. Whenever we sin, we leave some kind of record of it. You could say, oh no, I'm really good at covering my tracks. No, because it's still engraved. If it's not outward, it's engraved inward, and eventually it will be known outwardly. Your sin, God said, will find you out. So that which is inward is always something that will be perceived eventually outward, and it was with Judah. It was written inwardly. It was eventually known outwardly. And their sin was also manifest influentially. Now remember those three things. Inwardly, that's where it starts. Outwardly, that's eventually where it gets manifested. But third, influentially. Look at the very next verse. While their children remember their altars and their wooden images, by the green trees on the high hills... O oh, my mountain in the field, I will give as plunder your wealth, all your treasures, and your high places of sin within all your borders. And you, even yourself, shall let go of your heritage, which I gave you, and I will cause you to serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger, which shall burn forever." And so their kids would say things like, Daddy, what is that little thing you're making? And the incense that you're burning, what is that for? And the father would have to explain, that's an altar to Baal or Ashtoreth or to Molech. And the actions of mom and dad would influence the next generation. I read an interesting set of statistics about parents raising their children and the kind of influence that parents exert on young children. The study said that if both mom and dad are spiritually committed and they attend church regularly, there is a 72% chance that their kids will also follow the Lord as regularly as mom and dad. If only the father is spiritually committed but the mother is not, there's something like a 25% chance, up to a 50% chance. If only the mom is spiritually committed and the dad is not, it goes down to 15%. The influence of both mom and dad, and especially of a godly father in a home, is incalculable. While Judah was sinning, they were starting inwardly, they did it outwardly, they had altars all over the place in Jerusalem, even on their own rooftops, but eventually with their own children. And it was that, that generational passing on of that sinful influence that eventually got them into trouble. Verse 3, God refers to Jerusalem now as his mountain. Oh, my mountain in the field. If you go to Israel, you'll notice that going down to Jerusalem, you're going up in elevation. If you're at say, the Dead Sea, which is 1,290 feet below sea level, and you go down geographically to Jerusalem, you will actually go up topographically from 1,290 feet below sea level to 2,500 feet above sea level. It's very mountainous. And in the 125th Psalm, it says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. God protects us just like these mountains form natural protection. God calls it his mountain, his possession, which sort of solves, as I see it, the problems in the Middle East. Now, I never, you probably never thought you were going to go to church one night and solve all of the Middle East problems. Well, actually, you can with this verse and other verses like it. God calls it his Whose land is it over there anyway, the Israelis or the Palestinians? It's neither. 
It's God's land. It's God's city. And in Leviticus, the Lord says, it's my land and it shall never be sold permanently. Now, having said that, that it's God's land, I figure it this way. God can give his land, his property, to anybody he wants to. Now, there's a beautiful bass guitar that I played tonight. It's not mine. I just borrowed it. It belongs to somebody else. A brother in the church has this vintage, I don't think it's a 67 or 73, Rickenbacker bass. It's classic. It's his. And because it's his, he can do whatever he wants. He could say, no, you can't play my bass tonight. Or perhaps after the service, he could say, you can have my bass tonight. (laughs) Point is, it's his. And he can do whatever he wants to do with it. So when God says, Abraham, I'm giving you this land. That's God's prerogative. And God said, I'm going to give it to you, Abraham, and to your progeny forever. Well, Israel had, uh, Abraham had more than one son. He had Ishmael, but then he had Isaac. And God said, Isaac, I'm going to give you the land that I promised to your father, Abraham. You say, well, what about Ishmael? Was he cursed? No, God blessed Ishmael and said, I'm going to let him and his descendants inhabit other places, other lands. In fact, God gave to the descendants of Ishmael much more property than he gave to Isaac. But the point I want to make is that Jerusalem and the land of Israel today, God gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and his 12 sons. And God narrowed the gift giving to those people. So that land of Israel belongs to the nation of Israel, the Jews. And that's God's prerogative because he said it's his. He can give it to whoever he wants to. So it's very simple in my view. God solved the problem. It's my mountain in my field, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, verse 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart departs from the Lord, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but her leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So which would you rather be in reading that? A shrub out in the desert or a tree planted by the rivers of water? Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the ways of the ungodly, nor does he stand in the way of sinners, nor does he sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His leaf shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. To live a life of trusting in the flesh, whether it's your own flesh, your own strength, or some other person, is to be cursed. You want a blessed life? Trust in, not that, whatever that was, but trust in the Lord. There's more weird sounds that come out of this church building and PA system than ever before anywhere else. I I, I think we need to come out. Hallelujah. Maybe that'll work once and for all. The shrub or the tree? To trust in the Lord is to be blessed. Now, I've heard this before. I don't know if I can trust the Lord. Really? Yeah, I mean, that's just a big blind leap. No, it's not a blind leap, first of all. That was Kierkegaard who said that. He was wrong. It's a very insightful step of faith. And it's it's to be blessed. Somebody will say, I don't know if I can afford to trust in God. I will say, I don't know if you can afford not to trust in God. What do you have left? I can trust myself. Oh, Okay, you want to live that way? Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. And you may want to write in the margin of your Bible, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Those who trust in the Lord with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their strength. Verse 9, the heart 
is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now look at verse 9. And as you're looking at that, I wonder if anyone reading this would look at that and say, I'm offended by that statement. For the Lord says that the heart, that would be your heart, that would be my heart, that would be our heart, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You might answer and say, well, I'm offended by that. I know my own heart. Do you really? Because if you really knew your own heart, you would look at that and go, you know what? I concur. I agree wholeheartedly, 100%. The heart is deceitful above all things. Let me tell you an interesting story. It happened years ago. In the days when the cameras weren't digital, they were film, and uh, the, the film was roll film. It was two and a quarter by two and a quarter was the format, medium format photography. And it was in the days of the first Kodak cameras when they all had leather cases on them. There was an evangelist in Glasgow, Scotland, who used to carry a Bible around in a camera case. And he did it for a reason, because he knew that cameras were scarce, and it was something of a privilege to get your photograph taken. So he'd walk around the streets, and inevitably somebody would see his camera case and go, Hey, w would you mind taking a picture of me? Because people love to have their pictures taken. Would you take a picture, and then would you send it to me? And so when they would stop the evangelist seeing his camera case and say, Hey, would you take a picture of me? He would say, Interesting that you'd ask. I already have your picture. Well, you do? How could you? Oh, I, I have it right here. And he'd open his camera case out, take out his Bible, and he would turn over to Romans chapter 3, and he would say, Here it is. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. All have gone out of the way. They have altogether become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongue practices deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. And he'd smile. He'd say, there's your photograph. That's a perfect description of you according to God, the doctor who diagnosed you. <laughs> How do you respond to that? Usually dead silence. And then the evangelist would start from there. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then preach to him the grace that comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But he began there. He began where God begins with the depravity of man. Man is depraved. It doesn't mean he's as bad as he can be. It means he's as bad off before God as he can be. Because you might read the heart as deceitful. Of, oh, you, you don't know me. Especially, you, you know, a, a parent holding an a innocent little child. Are, are you saying my child, my baby is also in that same condition? How could you? And I would say, just wait a few months. <laughs> it won't take long for every parent to discover the Bible's right. Do you ever have to teach a baby to lie? No, they do it naturally. Do you ever have to teach a child to misbehave or be recalcitrant or be angry or be fitful toward the... No, they'll do it naturally. You will have to correct them and steer them away from that. The depravity of man most every parent recognizes is true. The heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? It was C.S. Lewis who used to say, no amount of bad eggs can make a good omelet. That's good. No amount of bad eggs can make a good omelet. If you still think you're good enough for God on your own, listen, you're not saved. You're not saved. The only people who are saved are people who recognize they're sinners and need a Savior. 
You don't get saved unless you say, I need a Savior to save me. And you don't say, I need a Savior to save me unless you say, I'm a sinner. There's a lot of S's in that, but it's true. Sincerely true. (laughs) Sinners need saviors, and they get saved because they call upon the Savior to do it. So God says, I've looked you over. I've gone into the heart. It's wicked. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who knows it? God says, I know it. Verse 10, I test the mind. I search the heart, etc. Verse 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Now, this is all poetry that describes through this very unique, compassionate prophet, the state of the nation of Judah. And the Lord says, those who depart from me shall be written in the earth. Your name is written somewhere. You say, yeah, it's written, it's, it's in the bank. They know how much I owe them. And they remind me every month. Your name's written all over the county. You may want to just do an interesting thing. Get on Google and your internet and write your name in it and search for it. Have you ever done that? Fascinating what you'll come up with. Your name is written in earth, and one day you will leave the earth, and your name will be written on a tombstone on the earth. But I hope it's written in heaven as well. I hope your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because a lot of people will leave this earth, and their name will only be written on earth. It will not be written in heaven, and it will be too late. I love to go through graveyards. You say, you're weird. (laughs) Perhaps you're right. But I love to go and I love to read the gravestones, especially when I go to Europe, when I go to England, and I read uh, the elaborate wording of of people from eras gone by. Fascinating what is remembered. Somebody sent me a photograph of a tombstone that I keep the photograph. There's two photographs together because there was a lot written on it. And it comes from, I think, New Hampshire. Uh, It says on it, Pause, stranger, as you pass me by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. I have that in photograph form in my desk. I heard, though I don't have the picture of this, that somebody stopped by that gravestone, read it, and decided to write their own inscription, presumably on a piece of cardboard or wood. And they wrote, To follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. (laughs) Clever. He says, Follow me. I said, Well, before I follow you, where'd you go? Your name's written in the earth, but is your name written in heaven? If your name's written in heaven, I'll follow you. If your name's written only on the earth, well, we're all going to follow you eventually, but I want to make sure I don't follow you in the other direction after death. Their name will only be written. By the way, isn't it fascinating that we have a record of Jesus writing on the earth? We don't know what he wrote in John chapter 8. All it says is that as the Pharisees came to stone a woman caught in adultery, Jesus stooped and he started writing in the ground of the earth. I don't know what he wrote. I have a hunch Perhaps he was writing the names of the Pharisees. Maybe he, was, maybe he was thinking of this scripture and writing their names in the earth. And perhaps even afterwards, writing their secret sin. Here they were, ready to stone a woman caught in adultery, and Jesus doesn't say anything. Maybe he wrote, Shlomo, evil thoughts and theft, income tax evasion. And then Avi. And he just kind of wrote names, perhaps, on the earth. But it was enough to convict them after he said, You who are without sin cast the first stone. Anyway, they departed from me. There shall be written in the earth. Jeremiah prays now in the rest of this section, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. 
As for me, I have not hurried away from being a shepherd who follows you. I love that. Every shepherd needs a shepherd. He was a shepherd. He was a prophet of Israel. He followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The Lord is my shepherd, said David. Nor have I desired the woeful day. You know what came out of my lips. It was right there before you. Do not be a terror to me. You are my hope in the day of doom. Let them be ashamed who persecute me. But do not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but do not let me be dismayed. Bring on them the day of doom and destroy them with double destruction. Verse 19. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the gate of the children of the people by which the kings of Judah come in and out, by which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem. The gate referred to in those days was known as the Fountain Gate. It was in the upper city, and it was over on the west side. And if you ever make it to Jerusalem with us, it is in the area of the present-day Jaffa Gate. That was the fountain gate. That was the gate in the Old Testament that kings would walk in and out of because their palaces were built in that section. And it was easier for them to maintain entrance and exit to that city on the northwestern side. And that's the gate Jeremiah was called upon to give a message. And say to them, this is what God wants to say to these kings now. Hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem who enter by these gates. So can you picture this fiery, bearded prophet, finger raised in the air, people are coming in and out of the gates of the city for their commerce, going, coming in for worship. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. It's even in God's top ten list, isn't it? You shall hallow the Sabbath day. You shall keep the Sabbath. But they did not obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. And it shall be, if you diligently heed me, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath, but hollow the Sabbath day to do no work in it, then shall enter the gates of the city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding chariots and horses, they and their princes accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever." And they shall come from the cities of Judah, from the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, that's the tribe next door, from the lowland, from the mountains, from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offering and incense, bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of the Lord. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, I will kindle a fire in its gates." And it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. What's up with this? Here's what's up. God told him, honor me. And one of the ways God wanted the children of Israel to honor him is a covenant of keeping Saturday, the Sabbath day, from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Keep the Sabbath. And, and here was the deal. God said, Rest, man. Relax. Hang out. Don't do any work. Now, to me, it sounds a little weird that people wouldn't say, really? You mean I get to do nothing? That's right. You mean I don't really have to work or like pull up weeds around the garden or fix the kitchen? My wife really wants that done. No, Saturday you hang out. You have to do no work. Done. Lord, whatever you say, hallelujah. But God had to give them a command, then they broke it. And here's why they broke it. They figured... Well, it is an extra day to make some extra money. So why shut the gates? Why not bring in some of the loads of my produce and commerce in and out of the city and use it as a day to make some money? Now, there was, in our country, sort of the tacit understanding 50, 100 years ago that everybody takes Sunday off. It's the Lord's Day. Let's not have anything open. Let's just shut down business. Oh, but why? You know, I mean, it's, it's an extra day. You can make some more money. 
Now, going back to Israel, the Sabbath keeping was a barometer of their spirituality. That's all. The fact that they wouldn't obey God on the Sabbath was an indication that they weren't obeying God in other areas of their lives. It was the barometer that showed the intensity of their love and obedience to God. It was because they failed to keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath day and the Sabbath year, that God brought them into captivity. Again, you may want to write a note in the margin of your Bible just now and, and, and write 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Because it will tell you that one of the reasons God took Judah into captivity for 70 years is they failed to keep the Sabbath. Now listen carefully. Because some people today say, yeah, that's what's pro the problem with the church these days. We're not keeping Saturday, the Sabbath. And God wants us to keep Saturday, the Sabbath. And Christians shouldn't go to church on Sunday, but on Saturday, the Sabbath. I've even had people tell me, that Christians are taking the mark of the beast because we're worshiping on Sunday rather than on Saturday. I tell them, first of all, it was a covenant God made with the Jews, not the Gentiles. It's a law that is not repeated in the New Testament. The other laws of the Bible are repeated. Thou shalt not commit adultery works in the old and the new. You shall have no other gods before me, works in the old and the new. You shall not kill, works in the old and the new. All of the laws in the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament except one, the Sabbath. It was part of the covenant God made with the Jews, not the Gentiles. And it pointed to Christ. Second thing I tell them is they're not keeping the Sabbath either. Oh, yes, I am. I worship every Saturday. And I tell them, well, so do I. I worship... Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day. And by the way, by this time I usually have my arm on their shoulder. I want to bring them close. Paul the Apostle said, One man esteems one day over all the rest of the days of the week. Another man esteems all of the days alike. And then Paul said, Let each one be persuaded in his own mind. Friend, I say, you're persuaded that I should worship on Saturday. I'm persuaded in my mind that I should worship God every day. I'm persuaded in my own mind. Well, I'm persuaded it's Saturday. Great. God bless you. Be persuaded in your own mind, but don't try to persuade me. And then I say, you're not keeping the Sabbath. I am keeping the Sabbath. I say, oh, you say you're keeping the Sabbath, but you're only keeping part of it. I ask them, do you keep the Sabbath year? And they'll usually look at me puzzled. They'll say, what do you mean the Sabbath year? I said, yeah, you're keeping only the Sabbath day, but did you know that God took his people into captivity for not keeping the whole Sabbath year? And then I explain what it says in Leviticus. It says, work six days, the seventh is holy to the Lord, you shall do no work therein. Six years you shall work the land, the seventh year you let your land lay fallow. So I say, let me ask you a question. What do you do? I'm a business owner. Do you take the seventh year off? And just whatever happens in your business, you just let it go? Well, that'd be suicide. You're not keeping the Sabbath. And the children of Israel, see, this is how it worked. The seventh year, debts were remitted and the land was able to be redeemed on the seventh year. Uh, seven sets of seven years, or 49 years, after that was the 50th year, the Jubilee year, all of the debts were completely free, and the land reverted back to its original owner. This is all part of the Levitical law. Because the children of Israel failed to keep the Sabbath year, and they did it for 490 years, divide that by seven, how many years is that? 70 years. That's why God allowed them to be in Babylon 70 years. Because they failed to keep the Sabbath year regulation for 490 years or 70 Sabbath years. So God basically said, you owe me 70. Now I'll just take it out of one generation. You just do 70 years time, then I'll bring you back to give the land its rests. That's all in 2 Chronicles 36. So there's Jeremiah the prophet saying, Use the Sabbath day as a barometer for the fact that you're not obeying me in any of these other areas. And he said, if you only would, if you turn back to me, if you'd keep 
my law. I would make sure that in these gates comes blessing and kings and a perpetuity of rulership that is godly. But you keep disobeying me, and I'll make sure that the Babylonians march to these gates and burn this place down to the ground. And he did. And the land that says, Second Chronicles 36, the land enjoyed its Sabbaths. You say, well, how can God do that? Remember, the land is mine. So the land is his. Your house is his. Maybe it's mostly the banks today, but it, really it's his. Everything belongs to the Lord. We're just tenants. We're just stewards in this place. Now, in chapter 18, we don't have time to go through it. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to press it. I was going to cover two chapters. I thought, should I do two or should I do four tonight? And I thought, well, and I'm looking at it and I go, we'll do one tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're reminded tonight that we belong to you. You're sovereign. And tomorrow the ladies are going to learn through the beautiful books of Ruth and Esther that you are providential. That you move people and move characters on the stage of history and, and cause famines even to get your work done and get people in places that you want them to be in. Lord, we can rest in the fact that you know our tomorrows intimately. And we should never be afraid to trust an unknown future into the hands of a known God. Lord, I pray that our names would be written in heaven, not just on earth. I pray that we would be those who would be, rather than a shrub drying up in the middle of the desert, we would be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, trusting you. Because every time we look to the arm of flesh, be it ourselves or another person, we get burned. And so we look to you tonight. As your people, we make that confession. We trust you, Lord. We love you. We know that you know what you're about even though for us sometimes it's dark and confusing. Lord, whatever burden we're facing tonight or carrying, I pray that we would hear and now, even in this next song, bring it before you. It's yours. We cast that care. We lay that burden down. Heavenly Father, I pray that if anyone is here who doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that tonight they would make that commitment to Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray.